I'm Andrew Sherman. I'm a Texas transplant who has always been in pursuit of art as a career. I've played in bands, pursued an acting career in Hollywood, but I found it behind the lens of a camera here in Dallas, Texas. I was born in New York, I've lived in Chicago, Los Angeles, Austin, but I love Dallas. There's a magical artistic scene in Dallas that mostly goes unnoticed to the outside world. This podcast is focused on what makes it so special and the people who make it thrive artistically. If you don't live here, and even if you do, you might not have heard of them. This is the Dallas Famous Podcast. So who you gonna be? Who you gonna be when you're all gone? Who you gonna be? Who you gonna be when you're all for us? Yeah. Lily Taylor is a musician, but she's also so much more. Her second full-length release comes out later this month. But she's also been doing a ton of collabs over the years. She's a vocal coach, she books shows, she was a drag queen, and she even has her own radio show called Band with Texas, which has been running bi-monthly on KUZU Denton since 2017. Lily even has an experimental band with her husband, Sean, where they won the 2019 Observer Award for Best Experimental Music. Lily is kind of amazing, and I know you'll think so too. Here she is. Hello, this week we have the lovely Lily Taylor with us here. Hi. Hi. Thank you. So I was just uh, starting by saying that I have so many questions on my sheet for you. Um, because, well, I mean, partly because your your uh, website, you've got like a timeline, which is really cool. Yeah, I, I, um, I've i tried to archive what I've been doing because I do so many different things. Um, so I tried to keep a list of what's going on and it used to actually be more. Uh, but I was told by a marketing professional to kind of tidy it up. Okay. It was a little all over the map, you know? Well, I'm sure, yeah. I mean, there's some years where you have one like thing on there. I'm like, I'm sure you did more than one thing that year. Exactly. Yeah. But, um, I kind of like it because I mean, I'm similar. Like I kind of had some gaps in, you know, well, let me put it a different way. You know, if people were looking at somebody as just a musician, they'd be like, well, why are they only putting albums out infrequently? Like, you know, cause the, your last album was 2015 right. and now you it's just put a, a new minute. album. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I, that's, I think that's cool because I mean, you know, you can assume everyone's living a life, but it's cool to see that you're, you're not just raising a family. You're like, you know, all the things you're actually doing, not that there's nothing wrong with that, but you know what I mean? Sure. It's cool to see it. All yeah. I mean, I think anybody involved in the creative arts has to figure out how to be involved in the creative arts and then also live. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, that's just the nature of, uh, how we decided to create our society. So, yeah. um, you know, there are some years I'm able to put more attention towards my music. Sometimes I'm putting more attention towards putting together showcases. Um, sometimes I'm helping out art shows or art collectors. It just depends, uh, what, you know, what comes across my calendar. Yeah, no, I mean, it's cool. Like I, I, it's, it, it's sort of like a survivalist mentality, but it's all within art, music. Which... Sure. I have this term, I, I call people lifers and it's when I can identify a creative who's just dedicated their life to living out this creative journey and huh. being, uh, explorative and curious and inquisitive and, um, they want adventure. They're looking for what other artists are doing. They're wanting to express themselves. And those are the kinds of people I try to surround myself with. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go, let's do the boring stuff. Okay. I I think you're from Boston, right? I was born in Boston. Uh, I was really raised 50-50 Dallas and Boston. Okay, how was that? Uh, so when I lived in New England, we would come back here to visit my mother's family. And uh. then when uh, my mom got sick and we moved out here to, so she could be closer to family. And then I went back every summer and holiday to go spend time with family up in New England. Uh, and I did that until I was 19. Okay. So it's really, it's really 50-50. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. How, how did, how did like, when was the first that you can remember time where you're like music, this is not just something in the background. This is something that means more to me. I have been compelled since day one to mm. be singing. I'm singing along with everything. It's like an annoying uh-huh. occurrence in the household. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm obsessed with, absolutely obsessed with radio, AM radio, FM radio, uh, Rick D's in the weekly top 40, you know, just <laughs> so into that. And in Massachusetts, there's college radio. So I'm just trying to listen to everything I could. My parents had a small record collection. It was just something I was always obsessed with. And when uh, I I moved schools to here to, in Texas. Uh, you you cannot do art and music. You have to choose. Huh. So I chose 
music. And that's really how it ended up funneling me through. Uh, I ended up at College of Santa Fe in Mm. Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Mm. they had an incredible contemporary music program. So I was exposed to even more ideas about what music was and what music was to different cultures, uh, what music was to different tuning systems, how to listen differently. And it it really changed the trajectory of my life. Interesting. Okay. And so you're Primarily a vocalist? Yes. Is that your main? You, That's my main jam. Okay. I mean, when I go to sing, I'm really proficient in it. When I go to play the piano, I can plunk out some chords, but right. it's not, I'm not a pianist, but I am a vocalist. I'm trained and um, I teach vocal studies. So, okay. Well, I mean, I, I'll, I have all these questions in my head, but I feel like I went ahead and made a, a sheet, oh, and, good. but I did it for a reason because it's chronological because your, okay. your sheet was so chronological. Cool. Uh, yeah, I'm actually prepared today. Um, oh yeah. Okay. So I saw a lot of stuff, collabor- collaborations in San Francisco. Yes. I used to live in the Bay area. Okay. So started, um, started performing under my own name in Santa Fe, uh, after I graduated college and then moved out to the Bay to see what I could do. And I got involved with Karina Danique and her band. Uh, and she also sings with the Cottontails, which is a jazz ensemble. Mm-hmm. So I sang with them. She'd let me sit in with the band. And then I joined her band and started singing backup harmonies with her. And I I would open those shows with my own solo material Uh, um, and began performing more and more and more and got involved in the burlesque scene, uh, singing in those shows, and um, and then eventually worked at Counterpulse as a theater manager, and that got me connected to the drag scene. So I used to perform at the Stud in San Francisco on Friday (laughs) nights as a drag queen. Oh, uh, wow. Way back in the day. I mean, this was a long time ago. But But, I mean, as a drag, were you a man? Uh, um, no, I'm I'm a lady. Um, uh, it's a very welcoming, open scene of performance art. Drag is I see the um, it's an art form. So you're, of you, what appealed to you to perform is just you just like wanted to. Do I, that. Yeah, I wanted to dress up and perform and have money thrown at me. That sounded uh, great, you know. <laughs> so, and they let me do my own songs. Um, sometimes oh, wow. we would do other songs, like we did a Nina Simone tribute, that uh-huh. kind of thing. And I'd be able to do that. There was a talent show. I did a Klaus Nomi song. You know, different things because it's a it's sure. a review. It's a variety show. Right, right. But those experiences helped me uh, build showcases back here in Dallas and uh. understand what could be put together and what could be presented and. Uh, you know, the logistics of that. Uh-huh. How do you get your mic working in a space that doesn't have a good PA system? Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of thing. Right, right. You know, I skipped right over this. What, what, what kind of music like speaks to you most and what do you consider like your, for your influences early That's, on? Yes. Um, my influences are so varied. Um, so recently I've been really tuned into the work of Jay Clayton and she's a vocalist, um, was based in New York for many years. And she has this idea that everything you listen to, you're absorbing everything you hear and experience is getting somewhere stored in your mind. Or I like to call it like my musical DNA or something like this. Right. Mm. Um, and, and so you can pull from those experiences and those, uh, ideas when you, you are performing. Um, whether it's a recording session or live on stage or an improv or you're trying to execute your phrase in a composed piece really well, something like that. So, um, like Tina Turner has been a huge influence on me. I don't sing like her, but uh, how can you not be influenced by such energy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Brian Eno, like the idea of being on the stage as a producer, a producer who performs, and we have that in Dallas here. Michael Briggs does that all the time. An incredible musician and producer, and he'll be up there on stage in, you know, being involved. Uh, he's performing recently with Laura Like Kay, who I'm a huge fan oh, of. Oh, right, yeah, she was also, uh, on here. Yeah, she was, yeah, you just interviewed her. Um, yeah, I'm super influenced by her work. Um, lots of Dallas musicians and performers influence me because I've seen them and you can't, it's infectious. Like, how can you not? Oh, the scene here is amazing. <laughs> like, um, Maddie Michelle, the yeah. first time I saw oh, her, right. she like pulled the notes out of the ground through her body and out into the audience. I mean, it was like, it was amazing. She's not human, I don't think. <laughs> ah, right. Well, yeah, I think she has a song about that. Uh, um, okay. Yeah, so, you know, seeing people do their thing here, and uh, as well as 
top 40 kind of music. And then I'm also interested in the idea of music as art. So that makes me want to listen to different textures. That makes me want to look up different composers who are trying to explore techniques or pushing the sounds or pushing um, ideas. Uh, like driving over here, somebody hooked up plants to a synthesizer and it's, huh. you know, they're talking on the radio about you know making music and soundscapes from plant energy. Like I'm here for it. That's so wow. interesting. Wow, that's, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, um, so it's hard for me to answer a simple question like, what are your influences? Because it's like I have ADD and uh, <laughs> a lot of interests. So yeah. um, I just want to soak it up. Yeah, I didn't expect that. That's cool. You're the first person that asking their musical influences, talking about visual influences or elements of a performer that you're not influenced by the music as much as the performance. I think that's interesting. Yeah. Like, you know, um, are you present at the performance? Are you there to actually absorb what's going on? Right. So that's something I ask myself when I'm going out. Mm -hmm. Um, there's so much to do here. It's, it's hard to choose Too some much nights. To do here. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes I feel that way. Sometimes I don't. It yeah. depends on the I guess, day. I guess. I, and it depends on what you're looking for, I guess, too. Right. Because there's something for everybody yeah, here. It's true. You just have to know where to look. It's it's sometimes very hidden. Right. Yeah. So you're mostly doing solo. I mean, have you you've had, you've been in bands as well? I've yes. been in bands. I've been in ensembles. I just performed with the Dennis Gonzalez tribute band at okay. the Kessler. Oh right, yes. Um, with Aaron and Stefan and a bunch of amazing musicians, um, and that was cool because I got to sing horn lines. That's super fun. Oh, interesting. Uh, thinking about your voice in, in different ways and yeah. what I can do with it. Um, that was super magical night. That was on Father's Day this past yeah, year. Yeah, I saw about it. I was working, but yeah. Yeah, it was special. Nice. Um, okay. And then at some point you started teaching yeah. vocal um, lessons. Yeah, a long time ago back yeah. in New Mexico. So um, I have smatterings of students and try to always keep it going. Uh, I always have a handful. Mm -hmm. And um, I teach about the power of your own voice. And we, we go over some music uh, theory and things like this, pretty basic, but it's a lot of ear training and it's a lot of uh, breath and body work and uh, learning to listen to yourself and uh, learning the confidence uh, in expressing yourself. That's right. something I struggle with. I think most humans do, <laughs> yes. right? Uh -huh. uh, yeah. So that's something we explore in my lessons. And like all ages you're doing? All ages. I prefer, I've worked with a lot of kids. It, it depends. It's kind of a bummer when it's the parents idea not the kids idea right right but um have you ever had a moment where the kid didn't want the lessons but you turned them around or the music oh yeah around? i mean you know you've got an hour with somebody or however long they've decided to come in for the lesson and um yeah i mean it's just two people in a room it's like today right like yeah. well, well what can we do what can we talk about what can we make happen in the moment Right. Yeah, definitely. You right. can always get something in there. Yeah, it's interesting too because I mean, there's definitely that old adage of "can't do, teach," but that's not you. So, I mean, I, I can guess things you get out of being a teacher that that you take to your work, but totally. maybe you can speak to that a little. Yeah, I think it's the, really it's those breakthrough moments in confidence or a mind body connection when you realize you have control over the sound of what's happening. And then it's making you a better storyteller because you believe that. And it's that faith in yourself and faith in the sound that you're making that it's uh, you don't have to judge it. There's no wrong note I like to teach. It's like you're just making sounds like the pressure's off. Let's just have fun with this. What's happening? And then in those pressure moments when you're on stage and the lights are bright and your equipment's not working and you just have to have or you're not sure what the lyric is next or whatever it is, you have to have a little faith in yourself. And um, because I know what I've listened to and I I can pull something out. Right. And usually that's the most magic because it's really authentic. It's in the moment. That's what we were trying to do in Dennis's, Dennis Gonzalez's tribute band because right. each one of us took solos. So we'd practice, but there were moments in those pieces where we didn't know uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> how it was going to go. And, you know, not every improv is a success. Sure. You know, that's just part well, of most it. Most of those improvs aren't on stage either. So sometimes, though, I guess, you know. 
Oh, like, okay, this one was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I talk about improv, um, there's like comedy improv, theater improv. Um, there's like freestyle, freestyle rapping improv, this kind of thing. There's jamming. Think mm-hmm. of a jam band or like over a blues uh, chord progression. You kind of improvise your lyrics or your melody. But then there's like free jazz improv, right, that really comes from the lineage of jazz and minimalistic music. And that's something else. That's, that's thinking about music in a different way, mm-hmm. a different state of consciousness. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm interested in all of those things. Sure. Yeah. I've dabbled in a lot of that. I mean, I did a lot of improv comedy and I'm, oh, you did? I'm into a lot of jam bands and I mean, I had an episode about jam bands. Oh, actually. that's right. I listened to that. So yeah. Um, uh, oh, so, uh, I, I did read your observer interview with Preston, another nice. guest of ours. Um, so I understand, uh, based on the article, but why don't you maybe for our listeners, you don't, like perform your show that often. No. Why is that? Well, um, the market, right? Uh Um, when I first moved here, there seemed to be a little more opportunity for, um, different kinds of music to come and perform on the big stages in Dallas. And since the pandemic, that is not a wise business decision. Mm -hmm. And having been a booking agent and a working box office at many venues around Dallas, I can, I can understand that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, we got to pay the bills. So it's, it's hard to, on a Friday night to book something compelling that's pretty out there and expect people from the mid cities to come into Dallas for their weekend trip Mm -hmm. and not have a a meltdown. Right. Sure. (laughs) um, Which I've seen, I've seen that happen. So, um, you know, it, it depends. I mean, if you think about like the Kessler theater, right, they have incredible programming, very consistent. They do business well, they know how to do that. Um, and then every now and then they have these incredible local concerts Mm -hmm. where they're supporting the local talent. Um, when you go, it feels like you're part of this village. You recognize a lot of people in the audience. Mm -hmm. You recognize the staff behind the bar. Everyone's saying hi. It's this amazing feeling. Um, but that's not every weekend. Right. right. Yeah. So I, I think about that with my own music. It's, I want to be performing in places that make sense. Um, I like I like the idea of non-traditional venues like gallery art spaces or house shows. Mm-hmm. I think of um, performance like that as an ecosystem. You have to get ready for things and cultivate an audience before you can take it onto the stage, like mm-hmm. a Deep Ellum Art Company or Three Links or something like that, where it's your responsibility to bring in people. Sure. Right. Sure. Um, it, and that's part of what you signed up for as a performer is that, you know, your coworkers for that night are the bartenders and the door people and the security staff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I wish more bands looked at it like that. But well, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, I'm an artist as well. Right? <laughs> <laughs> You've worked both sides. That's I've how you understand. Sides. Yeah. yeah. So I have I have a little empathy for both things. And I understand that sometimes you have to just put on a cool show and not make the money. Yeah. Uh, And sometimes it's important to pay that water bill or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you have to be flexible and strategic in your programming. Absolutely. I was going to say, like when I was thinking, when I was listening to your stuff, I had this thought because I was in bands in LA. By the time I got here, I was like, I'm just burnt out on trying to, because I I don't like to perform solo as much. Ah. And so I was just like, it's burning me out to like bring people together that I can't really pay the right amount. So I, my idea was that like, you know, you need to make your shows events, like do a theater show. And it just, I mean, your music to me speaks to that. Like, I feel like that's where it belongs. I mean, a house show in a art gallery, like all of that, I can see that. Yeah. I want people listening to what I'm, yeah. And what I've composed. And it's like, I mean, I'm in a lot of shows. It's, it's so tough right now. I don't, I can't understand it. There's barely too many bands is maybe what it is. I don't know. Um, I wouldn't say that. Um, I think it's, uh, attention to curiosity. There's, there, there's just really, that's an art in and of itself. You mean the show, the show, like the promoter or. Right. I'm, I'm talking about, I guess like what the point I'm thinking about is, um, like what happens within the month, right? What are happening on slow days versus more, uh, busier days, like a Saturday, Mm -hmm. right. And deciding, um, how to cultivate a scene with intention and really give support to up and coming artists and making sure that they get the opening slots consistently mm-hmm. to help raise the it, it's I think of it as a two way partnership. And I think um, I haven't seen that so often in Dallas. Sometimes you'll find places that are working like that mm-hmm. and other times like 
it's just nose to the grind. Yeah, it's interesting. You can you can almost tell when just walking in before the show starts which which place you're in. Is it a place that's paying a lot of attention to their overall thing or not? You know? Yeah. Um, well, this actually leads into the next thing. You were a booker. I know at Crown and Harp. Yes. Was that the only spot? Or um, Well, at the end, that kind of launched me into the music scene here. I had been performing as a solo artist. I had been booking these um, small underground noise shows called Hashtag Texas Noise hmm. um, at a lot of non-traditional venues in Denton and Dallas. And... Um, I was part of the music scene that like there was like an indie scene going on in 2014, 15, 16, um, where there were a lot of local talent trying to work together to put shows together. Mm-hmm. And Crown and Harp was one of those hubs. Two Bronze Doors was another hub. Rubber Gloves was a hub up in Denton still at that time, although under different ownership and uh, than it is now. Um, but uh, so there was a lot of vibrancy going on. And um, when the booking agent left, he went over to Deep Ellum and I stepped in and learned a lot Mm -hmm. about Dallas very fast. Um, That club was interesting because it belonged to everybody, but only on the nights that we curated for them. (laughs) (laughs) So people felt that they owned the bar, but they were only really there one Thursday a month or, you know, four Mondays a month or that kind of thing, you know. Sure. There's so many different things happening here. And that that t- experience taught me uh, how compartmentalized Dallas is. Yeah. Yeah. In, in that, that, that certain genres wouldn't bring crowds in? For- well, it was just that certain genres didn't know that the other genre existed. Right. <laughs> right. So you, you're bringing in social circles of people. Um you know, techno music, right? And getting really good about understanding what DJs are bringing what, right? And mm-hmm. the difference between techno and EDM. Those are different crowds, right? Um, thinking about uh, like a folk night, right? Are you going to do acoustic folk? Are you going to do alt country rock folk? Mm-hmm. Th- that's a different vibe. That's a different crowd. Are you going to have a metal show? Is it going to be a black metal show? Is it going to be a death metal show? Those are different <laughs> things, right? So um, because of my, because I am a music nerd, right? Uh, I got really interested in those nuanced differences and tried to match the different social circles with each booking that I was doing and marketing to those specific people. Right, right. right. That's um, fascinating. I mean, I, I didn't think of it like that. And I also, I, I know there's a lot going on, but I didn't think, because like to me, it's like, oh, that's DJs. Like they're doing dance. I know it's yeah. different, but I just can't. <laughs> I yeah. can't pay attention enough to beats. decipher. I hear some beats over there. Yeah, there's a lot of. It's going to be a lot of lasers, and I'm not going to get good photos, but there'll be dramatic photos. That's the way I look at it. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know what to say about that. I think it's just <laughs> that there. How deep do you want to go? Right. Sure. You don't have to if you don't want to. Sure. Right. But if you're but, really interested and in, and in a nerd like me, you're going to want to know. Well, what I'm saying is, it's like you need someone with that kind of like care and interest in learning about it to book and I don't that's definitely not happening I mean the, no. granted, a lot of booking agents are, are taking like one genre and that's all they're really focusing on I've noticed in a lot of cases um, I think it's like I see it as an aesthetic like they're well, building okay. sure. they're building out a, a bigger narrative and over time like Chris Humans is really great at that right um, uh, what uh, I can't think of the name uh, at the helm Helm of the oh sorry sorry we'll sorry, cut it Chris. out we we'll cut it all out don't worry about it <laughs> um, but Chris Human has been um, you know he's booked like something like ten twelve thousand shows or something wow. right so over the time that that's been happening you cultivate a, a brand sure. right that like these people trust that they know that that show is going to be kind of cool they're going to go there they're going to see some other cool people they're going to have a good time maybe huh. spend some money at the bar right and it becomes this cultural experience. Experience, uh, and I just like to remind people that there's many levels of that going on in Dallas. There's yeah. a lot of underground stuff happening, as well as going to places like you know AT and T Performing Arts Center or the sure. Meyerson or something sure. like this, or right? Even like Ar- Arlington Live back there. Yeah, whatever. yeah. I mean, I don't know. You you could definitely, like you said, you could get by without knowing all of that. Oh, but, definitely. But yeah, like I didn't think of it in terms of like you're creating a brand essentially. Like you know, like uh, you know, what's his name, uh, Mike Zemer. Uh, 
third string like he's got the kind of 90s hardcore thing you know going mm-hmm. i shouldn't speak i don't know what the fuck ah, but that's your impression that yeah. counts well i did it's shoot valid. i shot one so what festival <laughs> cool and uh i think it was like some 41 and you know like i'm always wearing earplugs nice and i'm like oh shit i didn't put my earplugs in no i had them in it was that fucking loud oh really it was so loud oh wow but i mean that's Nobody so else that, was complaining. Is know. that the brand that it's loud? <laughs> I, well, that's my impression. But like you have just like opened my eyes to the fact that there's probably a lot more subtleties and nuances going on that I'm Maybe. getting. I'm always looking at it from like how how easy is it going to be to shoot this and how soon can I get out of there? Sure. That's kind of the way. I mean, that's just being honest. Right, but that's what you're there for. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, that's valid too, man. We need uh, photographers to document what, what the hell is going on. Well, yeah, sure, sure. Um, okay, and then... Well, let's just, okay, so let's go ahead to, like, I'm looking down your list of chronological life events, and I see Bandwidth Texas. Yes, Bandwidth Texas. Shout out to Kuzu. Mm -hmm. How do you Kuzu? That's one of our hashtags. Uh So Kuzu is a nonprofit, low-power radio station based in Denton, Texas. It's a six-mile radius from uh, the square in Denton, and uh, that's 92.9 FM on the dial. (laughs) And then if you want to stream in live from any anywhere in the world, you can go to KUZU.FM. And I have a show on there twice a month, every second and fourth Tuesday. It's an hour. It's free form. I play whatever I want. They let me play long songs. I can play short songs. I play any and every genre I can possibly get my hands on. Hmm. Um, All mediums. I'll do vinyl, cassettes, digital, all of that. Although CDs have been kind of tricky for me lately because I can't my CD drive isn't working, Uh but, um, anyway, so it's lots of different kinds of things, different, um, talent, different sounds, different ideas about music. And sometimes I don't play musicians from Texas. Maybe they're passing through on a tour or maybe it's just that I'm listening to it and that suddenly counts. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. This is a silly question, but have you ever done an hour show where it was one song? Yes. I love that. Yes, I'll do that. I've done that with um, a raga, like an evening raga. And um, I've done that with some like experimental jazz stuff. So maybe not so much with the experimental jazz, but like the raga, like some of that stuff. Is it are like there's like movements? Is it like a... Yes. Well, in Indian classical music, there's there's a whole tradition, right? It's thousands and thousands of years old so there's different um ragas for different times of the day uh there's different traditions of ragas if you're in northern india versus southern india so it's it's always good to do a little research before putting wow you're like an encyclopedia on (laughs) the airwaves i I just threw out raga because you said it i was like any hour-long thing but then you're like well i'm gonna go into the there's a huge history of uh the indian diaspora in north texas so i really try to keep a nod to that and um um, you know, just keep that in my consciousness about form, formulating yeah. shows. That's okay. Wow. And so Bandwidth Texas, how long have you been doing it? Uh, since 2017. Okay. And um, I just did le- this past week, I, like my 140th show, something wow. like that. So uh, that's, that's been a wonderful opportunity for me to explore new music and learn about FCC rules. There's huh. all kinds of interesting payola laws and um, like you'll never hear me promote my own music on my own show. That's that's okay. that's a FCC law well, I didn't know about. Oh wow, neither did I. Right. So, um, and uh, th- we're having a record convention on July twenty second up in Denton. Uh, huh. A big fundraiser we nice. do every year. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, and <laughs> it keeps going because then you find yourself at top ten records. Um, yeah, I was at top ten records from twenty seventeen to twenty twenty. Okay. And that was an incredible opportunity. They had, it's the oldest record shop in Dallas, opened mm. in 1956. It's in Oak Cliff and it's part of the JFK assassination story. So international tourists would come in all the time looking for that famous telephone that J.D. Tippett used right before Oswald shot and killed him. Oh, wow. And if you're from Dallas, you probably have never heard that story. But if you're from Sweden or something, you <laughs> definitely know that story and you've come to Dallas to see the Wait, phone. Why is that? Why don't we not That's know that? That's just that's just how we do here. History oh, is a touchy subject in Texas. Yeah, that I will agree with. 
<laughs> um, um, anyway, so I was working there. They started uh, to, in order to save the store, they turned it into a nonprofit. And I had had experience working with nonprofit arts and culture organizations. So um, when I started working there, I saw a lot of opportunities of how we could uh, develop the programming and um, get some artists paid, uh, have an archive of Texas music that uh, recorded material. So people releasing new music could start uh, making sure that their music was included in the archive to create a broader understanding of all of the different genres that are happening in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, we are really I mean, the birthplace of many different genres, yes. right? Um, and that's not, never going to stop. That That is still continuing to this day. So might as well get everybody involved, right? Um, and that was super fun until the pandemic hit and circumstances changed and I'm no longer there. So, mm. But uh, while you were there, didn't you receive a grant to do I did yeah. in 2018. Um, it got very little coverage, but in 2018, I got uh, one of the Arts Activate grants, and uh, we did a concert series called Sounds of Oak Cliff mm. in 2019. Got that. everyone paid, and um, it was so fun. And then uh, after I've left, Evie Borman has been able to reapply for that grant several times and has booked those showcases, promotes those showcases, nice. and is making sure. Dallas musicians get paid for performing. Yeah. Um, so it took the burden off of um, collecting ticket money. Yes. Right. And we could offer free programming to the public and then uh, payment to the artists. Kind of like PBS sort of. Yeah. Well, it's public, right? Yeah, That's, yeah, exactly. All right. Well, let's. Wow. This is I mean, you're I I do a lot. We didn't talk about Meow Wolf. We didn't talk about. Wait, wait, wait. Tribal. What did you do we with did, Meow Wolf? <laughs> um, in 2020, I was on the team of helping uh, gather talent and making sure that um, certain people got seen by other people. Oh, and wow. a lot of those people were chosen and they're opening this weekend. Yeah, I, I went um, to yeah, the press opening. Great. It was amazing. Awesome. Our buddy Quentin Gray wrote an entire album for one of the fictional characters. Oh my gosh. I'm such a fan of Quentin yeah. Gray. He wow. was actually, he showed up and we got some photos. That and, is really special. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, uh, Alex Bohr's been a part of that. Teddy Waggy, Maddie Michelle, Donovan Bo um, Donovan Jones. So uh, all kinds of people. Well, okay. Before we get to the last topic, is like there any other collaborations you wanted to like talk about? Because well, you did a bunch. Right now, um, I'm, I'm well. I'm putting out an album. So well, album we're getting super to that. Exciting. So we can do that right now. I mean, that's um, what's the name so of the that's album? That's happening. It's called Amphora, and so that's my main focus right now. But the other uh, project. I still have going is a duo with my husband, Sean Miller. He is a educator at Dallas College, and we have a video audio soundscape droning noise theatrical thing that we do called locations oh. and we've been performing up in Denton for quite a while and in 2019 we won the Dallas Observer Music Awards for best experimental act oh, that is cool. but you know then the world ended so whatever well I mean but you're still doing it we're so still doing it the we're still catching doing back it up slowly yeah so we use video art that's generated with Max MSP and then I'm improvising over the sounds that are generated from from the live generative video and I use a symbol I sing through a symbol um, using a surface transducer to extend my voice a drum symbol a drum symbol right how, how well so the surface transducer is vibrating the sounds that are coming from my body and putting it into the symbol so when I go Ooh, you can hear the symbol do that as well okay I gotta watch this I didn't yeah. see that on the <laughs> <laughs> on the resume. Um, and I'll be performing that, uh, an improv set with that tech setup um, in the end of July in the Bay Area. Oh, wow. Okay. For Outsound's new music series. Okay. Is that, I'm just going to ask, but I'm probably under the answer. Is it a little bit more accepting of that experimental kind of music out in the Bay Area? Um, I would say they're both incredibly vibrant communities. It's just nobody knows about what's going on here in North Texas. Mm -hmm. But like we are a hub of experimental music. Um, we it, it expands Texas down to San Antonio, Houston, and Austin. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I'm leaving out other cities where it's happening. But um, yeah, experimental music is alive and well okay. in in Texas. You just have to know where to look. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, one place is going to 
to be on your website, I'm guessing. Yeah, definitely. LilyTaylorMusic.com. And that has links to everything else. And you can order the album on Bandcamp. I'm going to start shipping that out at the end of the month. Okay. So as the release, the official date of the release? Um, July 21st. Okay. Well, this is going to come up before that. Oh, yay. Okay. So July 21st, I start going to the post office and making friends there. (laughs) <laughs> that's awesome and we've got cassette tapes that are pea green I'm so excited about those huh. and um, the vinyl is all random color it was produced oh. at God of Grooves Records nice. shout out to them in Ohio nice. so so are you do you have shows for this uh, to support this well today I'm driving down to Austin and I'm performing uh, at Cheer Up Charlie's for night school with Troller oh wow and that's a big show happening to help support the album and then when I come back I'm I have some Thing brewing in a non-traditional art space. Okay. But the date isn't solidified when that's yet. Figure it out. We'll put that on our. Okay. Uh, awesome. But hey, Lily, thank you so much thank for coming you. in and talking this about your been art. Fun. Yeah, it's been great. We're looking forward to all this stuff and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank Lily Taylor for being my guest. You can check out her music in the links in the show notes. Unstoppable by Celine Nerala. You can listen to the Dallas Famous Podcast every week on Deep Elm Radio, Sundays and Tuesdays at 1 p.m., and then again on all the podcast places. Thanks again for tuning in.